Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we go before the Lord in prayer one more time? And let's ask the Holy Spirit tonight to be our teacher because I need his help. Amen. And so do you. Father, we thank you for tonight, Lord. We ask that you would speak to us, Lord, as we come before you and acknowledge that we are here to hear from you, from your word, from your spirit, Lord. Speak to each and every one of us, Lord. We pray for divine revelation in each and every one of our lives tonight as we dig into your word, as we hear your will for our lives. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here, Lord. We ask that you would continue to bless this house, bless each and every one of us in this place as we seek further into your word and into your will. In Jesus' mighty name, we all together said, Amen. Amen. If you've got your Bibles, go with me to Luke in the 8th chapter and Matthew in the 16th chapter. Luke chapter 8, Matthew chapter 16. Luke chapter 8, Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, Luke chapter 8. We're going to start in Luke chapter 8. One more time. Luke chapter 8. Matthew chapter 16. Just in case you were wondering, where were we going? You know, a couple of months ago, I was having a conversation with my mom. I love having a conversation with Pastor Deborah. Tomorrow is her birthday. Just in case you didn't know that, she uh, skipped town probably to avoid the embarrassment of being called out on it. But if you're watching, Mom, we love you. Happy birthday. But I love, one of the things I really love is having, having conversations with my mom, because if you know Pastor Deborah, I mean, instantly she can just go deep, like just, there's no like small talk to deep, it's just like boom, like let's just jump off the deep end, and so we're having all these deep conversations. I remember talking about the voice of God and the leading of God, and she was asking me about things in my life, and I just said, you know, mom, I just don't feel like right now in this season that God is speaking to me much. And she said, I feel like, I don't know, maybe he's just on the silent treatment. I, I can't f- quite figure out what is, what's going on, but I, I'm just, I want to hear the voice of God, but I'm not hearing it. And I just remember the frustration of that. I remember, you know, just the, the wondering about what's going on, what am I doing, this and that, and this and that. And I remember going to Israel just a couple of weeks ago, and one of the things I really wanted to do, one of my big desires was to, to go to Israel and just to really just hear the voice of God. And I just, I had this image in my head that, you know, I'd get to sit on the Mount of Beatitudes and just like so it in or, you know, go sit somewhere and, you know, where David wrote Psalms or, you know, in the streets of Jerusalem. And, and true to form, there were some spots and there were some times. And I remember I was reading this book, as a matter of fact, about hearing from God because I wanted to hear from God. And I was in Jerusalem reading this book about hearing from God. And I just remember God began to speak to me. And, and the premise was that God is speaking, but are we listening? And you see, I, I, I remember this a long time ago, and I think I have it here. I remember this a long time ago. I read this book, and it's such a great book. It was so profound to me in, in my development of, of, of my relationship with God by a man by the name of A.W. Tozer called The Pursuit of God. Uh, that man is just a transformational person, and whenever you read anything about him, you just are challenged and quickened to do something better for God. And I, he wrote in this book, The Pursuit of God, he says this. He says, I believe that much of our religious unbelief is due to a wrong conception of a and a wrong feeling for the scriptures of truth. A silent God suddenly began to speak in a book, and when that book was finished, he lapsed back into silence again forever. And now we read a book as the record of what God said when he was, for a brief time, in a speaking mood. With notions like that in our heads, how can we believe? The facts are that God is not silent, He has never been silent. It is the nature of God to speak. The second person of the Holy Trinity is called the Word. The Bible is the inevitable outcome of God's continuous speech. It is the infallible declaration of His mind for us to put in to our familiar human words. And as I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about that season of my time of God... I want to hear from you, God. I, I, why are you not speaking to me, God? Why, why do I hear? I mean, one of the things that, you know, in the church world that we're around a lot of, I'm around a lot of church people. You understand what I say? Understand what I mean when I say church people? Like, you know, I get to hang out with people around the world, but oftentimes my time is spent, cons- consumed mostly with people within the church realm. And one of the most frustrating things for me personally in, in the course of my life, ha- has been talking to people who have continuous, like, at-length conversations with God. Have you ever been around somebody that does that? Like, you know, I was talking with God the other day, and in the middle of our conversation, they go on talking about this conversation, and I'm just like, I don't have those. 
Like, he might impress something in my spirit, or I might open up my word, and I, and I see and I think, God, you spoke to me, but it's like, I, I'm not having this audible conversation with God like you. What, a, what am I missing out on? And, and there's just this, this, this continual, perpetual frustration in my life about hearing from God and receiving more so than anything the revelation, which is the spoken or God's desire or God's will for my own life. And what, God, what is your revelation for me and to me so that I can live and operate my life in your will? And I think if we're honest, if we look at each other, if we look deep down into our soul and, you know, many of us who are, who are just walking through the, this path that we call life, this journey that we call life, oftentimes we say, I feel like I just need God to speak to me. I feel like I've been asking a lot of questions, why God or what God or how God or who God or when God or, or whatever it might be. And God, when, when are you going to speak to me? I, I, I hear you that you speak to the pastor and I, and I see that you speak to that leader and I see that you speak to that guy on, on TV and it seems like so often you're speaking to everybody, but I just don't seem at some point that you're speaking to me. And we, we go through this period or these seasons of, of silence, of wondering and questioning, and what's this all about? And God, when are you going to speak to me? When am I going to hear from you? And, and as I was thinking about this, and as I, I've been per, per pondering this, this section of Scripture for a great amount of time, I, I wanted to take you to uh, Luke, I said Luke the 8th chapter, I lied, Luke the ninth chapter. I'm like, it ain't in Luke the 8th chapter. Praise the Lord. That's the scary thing when you do that. In Luke in the ninth chapter, I just wanted to, to read to you something. That's, it's a familiar section of Scripture that we all know. Well, we may not all know. You may not know this. But it's familiar to us here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. Why? Because what Jesus says in Matthew's account of the gospel of what Jesus says is what we uh, modeled and fashioned this church out of, the rock. And Jesus responds to Peter a, a, a statement. He says, upon this rock I will build my church. And that's where, and if you ever wonder why, we are the Rock Church. It's based on that Scripture. And so it's a familiar Scripture with us in the church. And we read about this in Matthew's account of his gospel in the 16th chapter. It's Mark in the 8th chapter, I believe. And then it's um, Luke in the 9th chapter. We read these, all three of these different accounts. And today I wanted to just point something out as I was studying this and I was thinking about this in Israel. We got a wonderful opportunity to, uh, opportunity to hang out for a minute at uh, Caesarea Philippi where Jesus spoke these words. And just to understand and just to think about what he was saying. And so here in Luke's gospel and Luke's account of what happened here in um, the ninth chapter, verse number 18, it says, it says, it happened that Jesus was alone praying. And he was in northern Israel in Caesarea Philippi. And it says, he was alone praying that his disciples came and they joined him. And he asked them, saying, who do the crowds say I am? And the reason I went to Luke, and rather than just focusing solely on what Matthew says on the 16th chapters, I wanted to point out, and we'll end up in Matthew in the same exact story, is I wanted to point out what Luke felt impressed to write upon this specific question. He asked this specific question to his disciples. He said, who do the crowds say that I am? And in the other gospels say, who do the people say that I am? And they respond back, and the disciples, they, they confer among themselves, and they say, well, some of them say that you're John the Baptist, some of them say that you're Elijah, and others say that you're one of the old prophets that have risen again. And then Jesus comes back, and he asks this question to his disciples. He says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, the Christ of God, or the Messiah, the chosen or the anointed one of God. And in Matthew, we'll read about that in just a moment, Jesus' response to that. But so often what we do is in this verse, and when I've taught it, when I've heard it taught before, we focus on what Jesus said to Peter right after that and, and the theological masterpiece that Jesus dropped upon building his church on the Revelation. But it's exactly this. I thought about it. it was so interesting that Jesus asked two questions. And if you, if you like Law and Order or any of those kind of movies that make you, make you think or TV shows that make you think about legal systems, I love law. My, one of my favorite things in university was, was business. Law just made me think about things. And, and, and there's questions that you can ask and there's questions that you cannot ask. And one of the questions that you're not allowed to ask in a courtroom is a leading question, in which a question in which you are leading the witness to a certain or particular place. You cannot lead them somewhere. You have to, it has to be organic. You can't try to make it. And so Jesus is asking a leading question to his disciples. And he says, guys, guys, who does everybody say that I am? Who do the crowds around say that I am? And I find it so interesting 
I find it so interesting as I read the commentaries, as I read what Matthew Henry had to write about these things. You know, it says that Jesus inquiring about his reputation amongst the people. But I believe wholly as we see throughout the Gospels and throughout the New Testament that Jesus has the ability to discern the hearts of men, that Jesus was not inquiring about his reputation around him. Because Jesus full knew, knew full well what his reputation was. And on top of that, Jesus didn't come for a reputation. Jesus came for a revelation. And so he was asking the disciples, he said, who do the crowds say that I am? And they came up with great answers. I mean, they could only, the crowds could only answer for what they saw. They said, man, I mean, did you see what this guy did? I mean, he broke bread and he made it, he made it multiply. Jesus, he, he went to that city and he was healing everybody. And, and, and he walked on water and, and, and he told us to cast our nets on one side of the boat. And we did. And, all, and, so, and people are saying, man, I don't know what to make of this guy. He must be like Elijah. You know what? He must be that guy, John the Baptist in the wilderness. He must be one of the prophets of old reincarnate to come back and to tell us and to teach us the ways of God. All great and wonderful answers, but all wrong when it comes to the revelation of God. And you see, we look at this and we think, well, Jesus was concerned about his reputation with the people, but really Jesus was not concerned about his reputation. He was concerned about his revelation. And see, Jesus didn't come for a good reputation among men. Why? Because if Jesus came for a good reputation among men, when you read what Jesus writes in John the 6th and 7th chapter, you can see that there was not a good reputation among men. Why? Because everybody left him. But Jesus was concerned about the revelation. So he asks them this amazing question, this insightful question, this leading question. Who does everybody say that I am? You know, so often in life we desire to hear from God and we desire to see this revelation from God and we desire to say, God, speak to us. God, tell us. God, lead us. God, direct us. God, guide us. And there are crowds in our lives that are speaking continually. You at, and wherever you go and whatever circle of influence you live in, wherever you go, wherever you are, there is a crowd in your life speaking influence into you. You go to your job, there's a crowd of people that are working and they have a consensus, they have an idea, they, they speak of what they see. You turn on the television and there are crowds of people that are influencing the world, speaking to what they see, speaking to what they understand. There are crowds of people within culture, within society, within the movies, within whatever it might be you see, we have all around us crowds of people influencing us in the directions of our lives, and we desire for God to lead us in our lives. And so Jesus says, who are the crowds and what are they saying? And then he asks this divine, this insightful question to his disciples, and he says, who do you say that I am? Think about that for a moment. The crowds often speak one thing. The crowds often lead us to something. I mean, think about it like now in our day and age, in, in this society as, as our world, and we're, we're two days away from the most pivotal, pivotal election that we've seen in this generation. I mean, a massive, massive, massive consequence. And you've seen uh, the tension within our own country in this election. We can see the influence of the crowds. The crowds shouting this, and the crowds shouting that, and the people saying this, and the people saying that, and the people uh, pushing their opinions or their agenda or their ideals on us that we might be influenced by them that we might be, listen to this, a part of the crowd. But you see, Jesus asked this question to his disciples and he says, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Because it's not about my reputation that I'm interested. I don't care what the crowds think about me but what I do care is who do you say that I am? And I love the disciple Peter he responds, and this is the man, Peter, that walked on water for a minute. This is the man, Peter, that jumped out of the boat when he found, after, found out that it was Jesus on the shore. This is the man, Peter, that, that went to grab a sword to protect his Lord and Savior from betrayal. This is the man, Peter, who I just believe so many of us can relate to. Peter opens up and he says, you are the anointed one, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ, our Savior sent to save us. And Jesus blesses Peter and Jesus says, Peter, man, what a good job. What a good job, Peter, that you, that you had that in Matthew in his 16th. I had you turn there. We'll finish now in Matthew. Matthew in the 16th chapter, Jesus says it like this. He says, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah. Why? Because flesh and blood, flesh and blood. Think about it like this. The crowd, the crowd didn't tell you this. 
The, the, the circles of influence on the outside of the kingdom didn't reveal this to you. You weren't, you weren't influenced by what people said. You didn't have to stop and think about, well, is the general consensus this? Or is the general populace this? Or, you didn't do that. He says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jodah. Why? Because the crowd did not influence you. What you said right now was not revealed to you by men, but revealed to you by my Father who is in heaven. Divine revelation. You see, Jesus was leading them to a place of understanding that we are not to listen to the advice, not to listen to the influence, not to listen to uh, the direction and the sway of the crowds, but rather to listen to the direction of God and His divine influence to us because we will either listen to one or the other. If we do not make a decision in our lives to listen to what God's revelation is for us, guess what will happen? We will hear the voice of the crowds in our lives. And let me tell you something. You may not think you have a crowd speaking to you, but you've got crowds on crowds on crowds speaking into your life right now the way you ought to be living. And we can either choose to live according to the voice of the crowds, or we can choose to live according to the voice of God. Who will you listen to? Who will you listen to? And so Jesus admonishes Peter and he says, good job, Peter, because the crowds are speaking loudly and they only speak what they know. But you see, it's imperative for you and I to understand this is probably one of the most, if not the most important question Jesus asks his followers. I believe some form of this question is asked every believer or every person as they face judgment at the end of their life. Who do you say I am? And as we face judgment at the end of our life, as we stand before God Almighty by ourselves, no crowds around us, we all say with mentality saying, well, well, you're Jesus. You're, you're the Son of God. I went to church that one time and, 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 and I heard what the pastor was saying and I, and I believe that you're Jesus. But Jesus says, what did you do with that revelation I gave you? Influence of crowds. The influence of crowds. You see, crowds are fickle. Crowds will come and crowds will go and crowds will continually change their opinion. But the word of God, Jesus says, is the same today, yesterday, and forever. Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but by no means shall my words pass away. God is speaking. God is speaking revelation into your life. The question is, are we listening to the voice of God or are we listening to the voice of the crowds in our life? And in my own story, in my own circumstance, when I was there, I can tell you looking back now, wondering, God, why are you giving me the silent treatment to understand this wholeheartedly that God was not giving me the silent treatment, but rather I was listening to the overwhelmingly loud voice of the crowds around me, the crowds of my thoughts, the crowds of my emotions, the crowds of my convictions, whatever it might be, and not listening to the voice of God. You see, God wants each and every one of us to be on his inner circle. What's so interesting about this section of scripture is that there's really two characters in this question and in this passage of scriptures. There are the crowds, the people, the populace, the general consensus, the, the democracy of people, if you will, the voice of the people. And then there's the voice of God or the inner circle. And Jesus asks, what does everybody say? Well, the general consensus is you're something great, but we don't know what. You might be John the Baptist. You might be a, a, a prophet. You might be a, a Elijah. You, we, we don't, they don't know. And there's the crowds. But then Jesus points to his core, his inner circle, his disciples, the people that were close enough to hear him breathe, the people that were close enough to hear him pray to God, the people that were close enough to see his facial reactions when the Pharisees would continually buffet him and come against him and, and, and challenge him and how he would respond. They were, they were close enough to see how he would respond. They were close enough to see and to understand his thought process and the way in which he lived and the way in which he loved and the way in which he operated in his life. This was his inner group of people, his core group of disciples. And so he says, there there are two people on earth, the crowds and the core. Who will you be a part of? Will you be a part of the crowds who speak what they see? Or will you be a part of the core who speak what God sees? That's God's desire for each and every one of us is God is speaking. Are we listening? Because if we're a part of the crowd, guess whose voice we're listening to? 
to the crowd. But if we're becoming a part of the core of God, then guess what? Like Peter, Jesus says, Blessed are you, Peter! Good job! Why? Because you have positioned yourself in a place where you are no longer listening to the voice of the crowd. You are now in the core of my being, listening to the voice of the very Father in heaven who guides the words that I myself speak. Peter, you're on the inside, and that's God's desire for you. That's God's desire for me to be a part of his core group of people. You're not designed by God to be a part of the crowd on the periphery, on the outskirts, on the fray from the outside looking in. There is an open invitation to every human being on earth. Jesus said, come to me all who are heavy laden. Come to me all. Why? Because I have an open invitation for you to not be on the outskirts of the crowds, but to be on the inside core of my being to live, to breathe, and to have your being within my words, within my voice, within my, your, your understanding of my will for your life. God is speaking church. The question is, are we listening? Dang. God is speaking, but are we listening? God is speaking, but are you listening? And so often we allowed the voice of the crowds around us, but God says, listen, I don't want you to hear what is good. I want you to hear what is revelation. I want you to hear what is mine. I want you to get closer. I want you to get deeper. I want you to go from the outside to the inside. I want you to be a part of my close-knit circle. That's why the Bible talks about communion with Jesus Christ. What is communion? Constant communication. A constant co covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. Not just a distant relationship of somebody afar off, but rather a close and intimate relationship. John talks about in his gospel that John was there on the Last Supper. Think about how close they were. That John laid his head against the chest of Jesus. He had his head on the shoulders of Jesus when Jesus was sharing his Last Supper. This is how close Jesus' disciples were who heard Heard the voice of God and now this is the invitation to you this is the invitation to me that we must come closer to hear the voice of God God is speaking but the question is are you listening God is speaking but are you listening so what do I do to get into this core of God what do I do to go from being a member of the crowd to a member of the core what do I do to get uh, closer to God and the question uh, remains what must I do to do this because this is the desire of my life is to know God's revelation for me it's so simple it's so simple it's so simple that we miss it it's so simple that we overlook it it's so simple that we want three easy steps to do this the question is how do I become Part of the core where I can hear the voice of God and no longer hear the voice of the crowds is so simple. Press in. Press into Jesus. Press in. Now the imagery here is not, not draw closer or just come on, come on in. And you know, The invitation's there, open the door. The image there is press in. You see, James is talking about uh, in the fourth chapter of the book of James, the, the brother of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus. James is talking about the principles of, uh, of godliness, and he's talking about uh, the, the condition of humanity. He's talking about our outward works towards God, and he says, you think that everything's good, but you don't understand that, that God yearns for you jealously. He wants you to be a part of his inner circle so much to the point that he's jealous over you. And then he goes on and he says in James, the fourth chapter, he says, if you would just draw near to God, he'd draw near to you. You see, God is speaking. The question is, are we listening? God, are you speaking to me? And God just says, I wish, I wish, I wish you'd just take a minute and come closer. I wish that you'd just take some time out of your busy schedule. I wish you'd turn off the TV. I, I wish you'd take some time and turn off the radio in your car and just, just get a little bit closer to me because if you would just take the effort, make the effort to draw close to me, if you would just press in, then, then I would draw near to you, he says in James, the fourth chapter. You see, pressing in, it takes hard work, it takes effort, it's going to take work on our part. The invitation is there for any person on earth to become close to God, to hear the revelation of God. God is speaking, but are we listening? And in order for us to hear the voice of God, we must make a decision to press in and away from the crowds. You see, Jesus, wherever he went, recognized the people that pressed into him. He recognized the people that pressed in, and there was a short man, Zacchaeus. He was a wee little man. And what did Zacchaeus do? He couldn't see Jesus, and he wanted to see Jesus. Zacchaeus pressed in. He climbed a tree. 
right? Jesus recognizes Peter jumped out of the boat with his jacket on in John the 21st chapter. He pressed in. There's this beautiful story. In, in the Gospels, and in, and in Luke, in the 8th chapter, Luke accounts this, this story of this woman, and she was hemorrhaging blood. She couldn't stop bleeding. She'd spent all of her money, all of her resources, all of her finances, trying to be cured by the hands of doctors, but she was left worse off and continually getting worse. And then there she saw and heard about this man, Jesus. And the Bible tells us in Luke, the 8th chapter, the second part of, I believe it's verse number 42, It says, but as Jesus went, the multitudes thronged him. Now think about this contextually for a moment. Jesus was surrounded by people. I mean, like, if you've ever been on, like, a public transportation or or something like that where it gets jammed in, the the, the shuttle at the airport, the subway in New York, whatever it might be, uh, people were rubbing all over Jesus, rubbing up against Jesus, just pressing and thronging him, trying to touch him, shouting out at him. And yet there's this woman who sees Jesus and she realizes in her heart, if I could just get close enough to touch the hem of his garment, I know I'd be healed by that. And so it says that she pressed in, she went, and she got close enough to touch the hem of his garment. And Jesus said, who touched me? And his disciples are scratching their head and they're saying, Jesus, what are you talking about? Who touched me? There's people all over you touching me. And he says it like this, he says, who touched me? Because there was, I felt it. And Jesus recognized, he saw her faith. And his response to this woman wasn't, hey, I'm so glad that you, you touched me. It was my hymn. You, got, you found the secret formula. If you could just touch the little tassel of my garment, then you know, you'd be healed. It wasn't that. Jesus says, your faith has made you whole. See, what was it? It was a decision on her part to say, I'm going to press in. I'm going to push against the resistance of crowds. Everybody's thronging Jesus. Everybody's touching Jesus. Everybody's shouting out Jesus. But she said, I'm going to push against everything. I'm going to fight my way to the front. I was a part of the crowd, but I'm going to fight my way through the crowd, to the front of the crowd, to the close parts of Jesus. And no matter what I do, I'm going to keep pushing, and I'm going to keep pushing, and I'm going to keep struggling, and I'm going to keep striving, and I'm going to keep going until finally she got close enough in the streets of the city to touch the tassel of Jesus his garment and Jesus said who touched me it wasn't about the touching it was about the action of saying I'm going to press in I'm going to leave behind what was going on and I'm going to press in I'm going to take the effort it's going to take to get close to God why because church God is speaking the question is are we listening you see the crowds of the world are speaking they're continually leading us and guiding us in the directions in which they think we should go God is speaking are you listening are you pressing in are you fighting to hear the voice of God because let me tell you something if we don't press in guess what we think God's going to have this big booming voice from the sky hey but the word of God doesn't speak like that to us There's a story in 1 Kings in the 19th chapter. This man by the name of Elijah has one of the greatest victories a man could have. I mean, literally, dude called fire down from heaven. And he consumed an altar. And then he went and killed 400 false prophets. And then he outran a chariot. I mean, talk about greatest victory, right? But now he's in this low point because he got a threat for his life. And now he's hiding in a cave. The the Spirit of God or God impressed upon him. I'm going to speak to you. I'm going to lead you. I'm going to give you divine revelation, Elijah. So in 1 Kings in the 19th chapter, Elijah's there in a cave, and the Bible says, uh, in 1 Kings in the 19th chapter, it says that a great fire on the mountain arose, and Elijah saw, but God was not in this great fire. And then there was a great earthquake and a great wind, and, and God was not in these things. And then it says a still, small voice came, a whisper, a subtle voice. Not loud and booming with the clouds and, 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 the, and, the, and, and the galaxies, but a whisper, Elijah, Elijah. The Bible says in Kings, when he records that, it says Elijah heard that and he recognized that and he covered his face and he went out because he knew that God was there. You see, it's going to take an effort to press in. To hear the voice of God. God is speaking to you. God's divine revelation is for you. God does not want you to walk in the life. As a matter of fact, Jesus himself said he came to be a light to the world. Paul the Apostle says in the book of Acts, as he's talking to a bunch of Greeks, he says, listen, God does not want you walking around, groping in the darkness, hoping and wondering that you might find. He says, Jesus Christ came to turn on the light in your life. But it's going to take an effort for you and I 
to draw close, to press in, to press against the crowds, to shut out the voices of things that are going around us. Have you ever been in a crowd? Have you ever been in a stadium? A couple of weeks ago, my wife and I, we went to, uh, to a church member's uh, car race. They're uh, Tony and Diane Forfa. They race. Tony races uh, uh, like stock cars. Have you ever been to a stock car race? It's loud. And then on top of that, the crowd is loud. And if you've ever been in a loud crowd before and you want to have a conversation with somebody, what do you have to do? You've got to press in. You've got to get close to the point where you almost have to sometimes speak directly into that person's ear. Why? To shut out all the other noises of the crowd and to focus solely on the voice of that conversation. It's exactly the same. God is speaking, but will you and I draw near? Will we press in? Will we draw closer to God by making that effort, by taking that time to say, you know what, there are things in my life that are important, but you know what, I, I'm, I'm going I'm to focus, I'm going to press in, I'm going to go after God like I've never gone before. Why? Because God is speaking. Are we listening is the question. God is speaking. Are we listening? You see, we've got to learn how to quiet the voices of the crowds around us and press in to the voice of God. Because church, I believe for you, that God does not want to speak to you through, solely through the person on the stage. So often we think, well, God is speaking through the pastor. God is speaking through the pope. God is speaking through the author. No, God, through his Holy Spirit on the inside of you, wants to speak to you, his revelation for you. And it's not just the voice of the pastor that God is using to speak to you. It's not just the voice of the pope or the voice of that author or whatever it might be. God wants to speak to you, but the question is, are you listening? How do we get into that close circle, that tight-knit circle, that core group of who people, uh, the people who hear from the voice of God? Simply put, the Bible shows us from Genesis to Revelation, the people that heard God were the people that pursued God, that pressed into God. God spoke to Abraham and Abraham chased him. All the way through Revelation, God spoke to John in the last book of the Bible. John chased him. God spoke to Paul and Paul chased him. God spoke to Peter and Peter chased him. God spoke to Matthew and Matthew chased him. God spoke to Zacchaeus and Zacchaeus chased him. God spoke to Samuel, and Samuel said, here I am, and he chased him. God spoke to Josiah, and Josiah chased him. You see, when God speaks, and when we put ourselves in the position by drawing to God, he will speak revelation into your life. You don't have to live in the dark. We don't have to wonder, is God speaking? God is speaking. Are we listening? God is speaking. Are we listening? Can we shut out the voice of the crowds? By pressing into God. Church, I just believe that this is a season that we're coming into in America, that we're coming into around this world, that more than ever now, more than ever, it is more important, more imperative that you and I as believers of Jesus Christ hear the voice of God and the leading of God for our lives. Why? Because as we face this new era, this new darkness that comes upon this world, as you can see, this world is going downhill quickly, that we are going to need to rely daily upon the voice and the revelation of God for our lives in order to endure, in order to make it, in order to run the race and finish the faith. Like Paul the Apostle says, God is speaking. Are you listening? My encouragement to you today is press into God. Press into God. Press in to the things of God. Shut out the voice of the crowds. How? Leaning in, pushing through what's going on in your life to get some time with God. Make it a priority. Make it a precedence. Here, I'll just share with you quickly today, and I'm going to leave it. I'm done on this. I told you I didn't have a lot. Is this. Simply, here's what I do. If you go in my car 99.9% .9 of the time, what you're going to hear in my car is worship. And I, I don't like to use that word worship because we constitute worship with slow music and praise with fast. Like I love Toby Mac and all those guys and newsboys and that's great and the pop music and the beats and all that. That's great and that's fun. I don't like that. I like worship. Why? Because the slow, the tender, the anointed songs that speak, that bring a presence of God continually bring my heart to a place of openness that I can cry out to God when I'm in my car God, I'm hearing and I'm worshiping. I'm singing along. My heart is soft. My heart is ready. My heart is palpable for you to speak to me. I'm preparing myself by pressing in in my life. Uh, what do I do? I take some time in the morning to get away from the family, to sit down and read the Bible. You don't have to read a whole book of the Bible to hear from God. It's not about quantity. It's about quality in the eyes of God to take some time. And then on top of that, to reflect on what God has said, to write it down somewhere in your life, to write it down somewhere in your Bible or in a journal, but position yourself by pressing in to the things of God to get to that inner circle of God's being so that he would speak softly and still to your voice because God is speaking church. Are you listening? 
He wants divine revelation for you. He wants divine revelation for me. And it should not be that we go through the course of our life asking, when is God going to speak to me? Because he is saying, I'm speaking, I'm speaking, I'm speaking, I'm speaking. Oh, I wish you'd stop listening to the crowd. And press in and just start listening to me because I'll lead you, I'll guide you, I'll take you to the places that I have planned for you. God is speaking. Are you listening? Father, we come before you tonight. And Lord, we just ask that you speak to us as you continually do. Lord, I pray that you would help us to, to find ourselves in tune with your voice, God, in tune with your impressions, in tune with your Holy Spirit as you speak to us through your word, as you speak to us through your spirit, as you speak to us through your divine creation. Lord, I pray that every day we would look up and we would see an opportunity to hear from your voice. Lord, as I pray that we press in, God, as we press in to, to hear that still small voice in our life. God, I just ask that you would reward us with your voice. Lord, reward us with your direction. As we reach out to find you, I thank you that your word is full of promises that you would continue and you would meet us on that journey to find us. And Lord, we give you that praise and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen? Well, hey, listen, before we leave tonight, before we leave tonight, I want to just take a quick moment and just ask you to take a moment and take a look at your life. I ask you this question, how's your soul? How's your soul? Not how's your life, things are good on the outside, everything's looking up, you know what, my wife and my kids are healthy and everything's good. How's your soul? When you look deep into the mirror, when you look into your life, when you look at yourself and you know that person on the inside, beyond the persona of what we wear on the outside, beyond the Facebook profile, beyond the Instagram photos, beyond all the things that we put on, how's your soul? How are you with God? You see, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians that we ought to examine ourselves from time to time. We have to look into our lives. We have to look into our, to our soul and to see where we are. And I want to just ask you just to take a moment and look at yourself. Where are you and how are you with God? If you were to leave tonight and you were to die, heaven, heaven forbid this be the case, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? You see, how you answer that has a lot to say about how you are. You see, oftentimes we think, well, you know what, I'm good with God because I think everything's good and I, and I hope everything's good and I, and I want everything to be good and I think I can and I hope I can and I want it to be. Oftentimes you think, you know what, everything's good, my soul's good because I went to church and, and, I, and I struggled to stay awake when the pastor preaches hard out. And, and, and because I went to church, God saw that and he saw my church attendance and everything was good, so we're good. Yeah, I, I, I think everything's good, my soul's good because I'm a good person and, and I try to do good things for people and God looks at good actions and good rewards and good deeds and he says, you know what, I'm so glad that you're a good person. If you be good and do good, it's all good. But can I tell you something, nowhere in God's own words... Nowhere in God's own inspiration, nowhere in God's own desire does it say that you can think, that you can hope, that you can want. Nowhere does it say that you can attend church and listen to the pastor preach his heart out and fall asleep. Or don't. Nowhere does it say that you can uh, volunteer. Nowhere does it say that because you're a good person. That that means that everything's good between you and God. Why? Because there's something way more than that. God's not after your outward deeds. He's not after his reputation towards you. He wants his revelation in you. Jesus Christ in his revelation said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And he said, no one goes to the Father except through him. Today, I want to give you the opportunity to examine our hearts and to examine our lives, to see where it is that we stand with God Almighty through his son, Jesus Christ. In John, the third chapter, Jesus, as he's speaking with a religious man by the name of Nicodemus, Jesus says these words to Nicodemus. He says, in order to inherit eternal life, the kingdom of God, he says, you must be born again. You see, that's how it is. That's how it works with God. It's not about abracadabra, magical prayer. It's not about, you know, a set of religious uh, uh, penance and, and religious obligations. Jesus says that until you on the inside, your soul, until your soul is born again, you can't inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because you see, we're all born into flesh or we're all born into sin. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans, Paul says that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Paul says in Romans in the 6th chapter, he says, for the wages of sin is death. We all, through no fault of our own, so to say, we're born into a disconnection, a separation with God. And Jesus says, until your soul is born again through me, you'll not find eternal life in a position with me. What does it mean to be born again? The, the Nicodemus religious leader said, what the heck are you talking about, Jesus? And Jesus said, what is born of the spirit is spirit, and what is born of the flesh is flesh. He says, the wind blows and you can't see where it comes from, but you know that it's there. 
See, there are things at work that are invisible, that are influencing the visible areas of our life, the invisible things of this world that influence the visible things of this world. You know that there are things in, in this world that you can't see, that you don't know about, you can't feel and experience. For example, the radio waves right now going from me to there to there. Why? Because you can hear the sound of my voice, but you don't see them, you don't, you don't, you don't feel them penetrating, but yet we know that they're there. Just as much as we know that the kingdom of God is real. Why? Because it's real enough for God to speak about it. It's real enough for Jesus Christ to talk about it. And it's real enough for you and I to take it seriously today. How's your soul? You know, if you look into the depths of your heart, if you look into the mirror, and you were to examine yourself, you see, you know exactly where you're at with God. I believe that there are those of you in this place today that you find yourself in a position of emptiness. You find yourself in a position of lacking. You find yourself in a position of wondering and waiting. God, when are you going to speak to me? God, when am I going to be that person that's not on the outside looking in? But God, when is it my turn to be on the inside? And Jesus says it like this in the book of Revelation. He says, listen, I'm returning. And when I return, I'd rather find that you're hot. I'd rather find that you're cold. He says, if I find that you're lukewarm, he says, I will vomit you from my mouth. It's a shocking statement out of the mouth of Jesus. And what he's saying is that I want all of you. I didn't die for some of you. I want all of you. And in that same section of scripture, he says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. He says, whoever would open that door. He says, behold, I will come in and I'll have communion. We'll dine together. We'll be in relationship communion together. See, I believe right now that the Spirit of God is knocking on the door of your heart, saying if you were to look and ask that question, how's your soul? And you know where it is. You know that there's something just not right that's out of alignment, out of, out of connection with God. The Spirit of God's knocking on your heart right now, knocking on your soul, saying, come on, it's time for you to take the decision, make the decision today to be right, to get things right with God, to follow after Jesus Christ today. You see, Jesus said that he came that you and I would have life, that you and I would have life more abundantly. And that's not just speaking about eternal life, that's life in your soul. He wants you to have a good and abundant life in your soul. And when your soul's good, guess what? Everything starts to follow suit in your life, the outward appearance of your life. But it starts with that. Who should give your heart and who should give your life to Jesus Christ? Today, I want to give you that opportunity. In just a moment, I'm going to do something. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go like this. I'll go one, two, and I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go three. Bang! Smack my hands together. When I do that, I'm going to ask you to do something real bold. I'm going to ask you to pop your hand up. You see, what you're doing by the raising of your hand, you're saying, you know what, today I want to give my heart, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you right up front, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray a prayer of salvation together. You're going to invite Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life. You're going to pray a prayer of belief and confession of Jesus Christ in your life. And I want to include you in that prayer. And what you're doing is you're saying, you know what, today what you're talking about is what you're talking about to me, and that's me. I want to make that decision to follow after Jesus in my life. Who should raise your heads if you've never given your heart, you've never given your life to Jesus? If that's you in just a moment, get ready. If you're not sure in this place, if you've been walking around hoping, wondering, man, I hope I'm okay with God. Listen, don't walk out of this place. Listen, Paul says in Ephesians that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit in you is God's seal of approval upon you. You do not need to walk through the course of your life wondering and hoping and waiting that you might be right with God. God says, I want to speak to you now with my Holy Spirit on the inside of you. And it starts today by making sure that's you. You've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing. What is lukewarm? Simply means that you've got your ups and your downs in your relationships. You're not wholehearted for God. You're not wholehearted against God. Kind of doing the church thing, kind of doing your own thing. Listen, if that's you today, you know the condition of your soul. If that's you today and you're honest, say, today I want to give my heart. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I already see hands. If that's you in this place today, we're going to count to three. And as we do, you pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. We'll put it right back down. And we're going to pray that prayer of salvation together. I want to, I'm going to ask you to come up here and we'll pray it together. I'm going to shake your hand and congratulate you personally. But let's start today by making that decision to follow after Jesus. If that's you in this place, you've never given your heart, you've never given your life to Jesus, wherever you're at in this place, this is your moment. This is your time. I'm going to count to three. And if that's you, you pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. We'll put it right back down. You ready? Here we go. One, two. Three. Let me see your hands in this place today. I saw that one hand over there. If that's you, I see that hand over there in the back. Anybody in this place? I see you back over there. I see you back over there. If that's you in this place today, pop your hand up so I can see it. Be bold, be brave, be proud of the decision that you're making today. You're making the greatest decision you possibly can make. Anybody in this place? About four or five wise people. Say, man, I wonder if I should. God is speaking. Are you listening? I see you right there, sister. God is speaking. Are you listening? He's knocking on your heart. Are you listening today? I see you right there. Anybody else in this place today, about seven wise people, say, man, I wonder if I should. Yes, you should. It's time to respond to the invitation of God in your life. Anybody else today? Anybody else today? There's about seven wise people. Praise God for them. Let's give the Lord a great big praise for you guys. 
Here's what I said. I said that we're going to pray a prayer together, and I want to pray that prayer with you. I want to congratulate you. I want to look you in the eyes. I want to tell you you're doing a good job in life, and so here's what we're going to do. In a moment, everybody's going to stand up. My friend Elijah's going to sing a song, and as he sings that song, if you raise your hand, or you should have raised your hand, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible. A friend, if you need a friend, family member, if you came with a family member, just bring everybody. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Come and get into the aisle. Come meet me right here at this altar. Let's change destinies together. Let's pray together right here, right now, and accept Jesus into your heart, into your life. Come on, come meet me right here if that's you you come if that's you great job hang on we'll just pray in a minute okay if that's you you raised your hand you're serious about giving your life to Jesus come on this is your moment this is your time to commit to Jesus They're coming. We'll wait for you. This is your moment. Well, praise God. Four of you came. I know I saw your hands. I know you're not here. And listen, I'm just going to love you enough to tell you the truth. We talked about pressing in. We talked about pressing in today. You want to get on that inside circle of God. You want to hear the voice of God. It's going to take a pressing in on your life. Pressing in means you're going to have to start pressing against, pressing against your flesh, pressing against that embarrassment, pressing against what you might feel people might be thinking about you and forgetting that. Stop listening to the voices of the crowds in your head, the crowds around you, and press into what God wants for you. So if you raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand, I'm going to ask Elijah to sing that song one more time. I want you to know this, that you're worth pressing into God for and I want to pray this prayer and I want to include you I want to congratulate you today so that's you come on get out of your seat come meet me in this place today and let's change destinies tonight right here right now that's you come on press into Jesus All right, praise God. You can't, girl, let me give you a good job. Good job. Listen, guys, you know what? You might, your life might have been made full of, this might be full of mistakes, full of wrong decisions. Mine too. Good thing you're not alone, huh? But let me tell you something. You know you're making the very best decision you possibly can make right here, right now to give your life to Jesus Christ, to, to check the condition of your soul and to give it to God for your future. I tell you what, there's no better decision you can make. Somebody needs to tell you, good job. Good job. Good job. doesn't matter what you've done. Good job today. I said we're going to pray a prayer of salvation. Today what we're going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to lead you guys in a prayer. Listen, God does not listen to the words of your mouth like abracadabra. He listens to the prayers of your heart. So just because I'm saying a prayer doesn't mean that you're going to repeat some magical formula and everything's going to be good. It's the prayers of your heart that God listens to. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer. You believe this with your heart. You believe this with your heart and confess this with your mouth. The Bible says you shall be saved. So let's all join together in prayer. You repeat these words after me. I'm going to ask everybody in the place tonight to repeat this prayer after me as we go before the Lord to get together. Would you just pray with me today? Father God, I come to you today and I acknowledge that I need you. I give my heart I give my life to you. I surrender my life to Jesus Christ. I ask tonight that you forgive me of my sins, cleanse me of my past. I make the commitment today to walk away from my past and to dedicate my future to you. I give my life to you, to Jesus Christ. I believe that he came. I believe that he lived on this earth. I believe that he died for my sins on a cross. And I believe that he rose again. And today, I profess, proclaim that Jesus is my Savior, the Son of God, my Messiah, my chosen one. I am a Christian, a disciple, a follower of God, leaving hell behind, headed for heaven. Fill me with your Holy Spirit tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. And praise God. Hey guys, a whole new life is ahead of you and we want to just take a quick moment to talk to you about that new life 
that's coming your way through Jesus Christ. And right over here, I got a friend of mine. And his name is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel wants to do just something. He wants to take you guys just right over there real quickly. Nothing weird goes on. He's going to give you some free information to help point you in the right direction. He's going to introduce you to somebody that will pray with you tonight if you need some prayer. That will invite you to come back and meet with them to talk about some things about the Word of God. To get you strong in the ways of God. So if you guys just turn to your left, my right. Go right over there with my buddy, Pastor Joel. Praise God.